buy your first guitar, uh, make sure it's twice as expensive as the guitar you can actually afford. You'll really love that guitar and you'll be guilted every time you see it in like sitting in your living room on the stand, you'll be like, I'm going to pick that thing up. So if you can only afford a hundred dollar acoustic guitar, buy one that's $200. Tokyo tonight. tonight you know i had a good friend who who passed away um for early on from covid um so and, and so yeah thank you it was really really tragic and i ended up writing a song on on this album for him while he was in a coma so his wife could play it for him and his, she would go in every day to the hospital and play him music and wow um uh, he ended up passing away after about four months in the, in the hospital and it was really just the greatest guy anyone's ever met you know just that guy everyone was uh, like you meet him in five his yeah. name is nick cordero yep nick yeah i i was following that whole thing ever since it was it was going on man and that's just brutal i couldn't believe it it was you know he was in our pod of of, of friends and uh mm -hmm. and it was like you know my friends and i we we, we say uh, early on we we got nicked because so many people don't they weren't, they were seeing the news and, you know, young people were like, ah, you know, it's just a flu or, you know, right. we can go, we can go out, we can do this and not taking it seriously. And Nick was 41 and healthy, had no, you yeah, know, under, underlying, yeah, no underlying health issues or anything like that. And, and it was like, it was tragic. And so my friends and I, all this, we took it so seriously and we didn't see anybody. We were like, same. there's like, we were like six people. Okay, if you, if you guys see anyone else, you got to let us know. Like, let's yeah. not see anyone else. And so, and that was even after, I don't know, four months of not seeing anybody, but on like right. FaceTime. So, um, once you know, once I got vaccinated in March, it was like, all right, let, now we can now we can hang out and we can. But other than that, you know, I just um, I just kept reminding myself how insanely fortunate I was uh, to not be experiencing what most people were. Yeah. And it's, it's a good, that was, the thing that's how that I got through it. It was just count your blessings every day, all, all day, yeah. all day. That's a great way to, that's a great way to put it, dude, because I, it was, I, I have was one of those people who had actually kind of try to pull themselves away from, like you said, the, like the news and stuff like that. And we were watching it because especially during the election, I wasn't even sleeping. And then at a certain yeah. point I was like, all right, I'm not doing the self care, the, you know, whatever I needed to do to, you know, uh, take care of me as opposed to just kind of like getting absorbed and focused on all that other stuff too. So, um, it, it was, rough. I, yeah, I, I knew, was... I, I knew it, it all, for me, it had to be about self-care. I had to do things mm -hmm. that were like, I, you know, I got in the best like physical shape that I could, you know, like I was exercising nice. every, every morning and mm -hmm. spending a lot of time outside in nature. And luckily being in LA, you can do that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just, and reading and reading and reading and, um, and, and writing an album, making an album and, and, yeah. and playing, I was playing live zoom shows for, you know, for private audiences, mm -hmm. you know, five, six times a day, just to have contact with people, even though it was like this, at least mm -hmm. it was like, I was still making people feel, uh, something. Um, yeah. And, uh, so I, that's the way I stayed sane. Yep. I feel, I feel the same way, man. And it was, it was weird because like, I never planned on sitting at a desk. I love touring. I love being, you know, that was, that was the exact opposite of what I wanted to do. And then just to keep saying, you know, same thing, bought, bought equipment, bought, you know, basically a ring light warehouse is what I've got now. Uh, <laughs> Cause I bought, yeah, you know, yeah, I built, I built a little, I built a little home studio, which, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and made my record and uh, you know, it was, it was right. awesome. You know, I, I never would have done that without this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's some like you try to find some kind of silver lining to it, too, because even the same way you were talking about with the BLM stuff and the protests and everything that was going on, and it did seem kind of apocalyptic in a way, I would try to look at it almost as like, you know, without the pandemic and everybody being, you know, home and not having to concentrate so much on trivial things. I mean, not that not that their jobs are trivial, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it keeps us distracted from focusing on what's important. I felt like the entire country finally got 
to you know absorb what was actually happening and they didn't like what they were seeing and they got to actually do something about it because they didn't have to worry about their rent because they couldn't you weren't allowed to work so right. and and whatever so everybody got it so i was like that's at least you know some kind of a silver lining um yeah. is that everybody's kind of eyes are open to you know uh everything that's going on around them so it was it was weird man it was a weird balance to to kind of try to maintain the entire time um when you, right, yeah. when you hey you know what i have a quick question for you because i've sure. never really done, i've never really done one of these things on the phone or whatever um it says here you're in the show everyone can see and hear you does is everyone just you no 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 we're live so uh this, i know they can hear we're, li we're live they can hear me but so anyone listening and they they can be watching this too they're watching this live. absolutely yeah yep oh, watching. well hi everybody um, i didn't i didn't know <laughs> yeah that. sorry about that i should <laughs> That's probably one of the things I should have said early on. I'm glad I'm <laughs> glad I'm clothed. Yeah. <laughs> or am I? Is it, I was just gonna say. I mean, we can only see you from the waist up, so it's up to you, man. It's only. Yeah. It's only no, it's look, I'm clothes. wearing pants. I'm wearing yep. pants. I was one of those weirdos who, like, in the very beginning, just did, this is another thing. So you did you did that kind of stuff to stay sane too. I made sure I wore pants and shoes as if I was going somewhere. To like, you know what I mean? And people, and my friends would be like, why aren't you more relaxed? I'm like, I got to do this. Just let me yeah. have this. They'd be like, totally. why are you in jeans and shoes? And I'm like, because that's what I'm used to being in. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. It was weird. You got to, you got to do whatever, it, whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. What was your, did you, when you were, when you were going through writing the album, stuff like that, did you, um, were you regimented in writing or was it just like when, when it, when it. No, I was, I didn't have to be, there was nothing else to do. Right. Yeah. That's sitting cool, on man. my couch all day right <laughs> yeah it's it's weird too because i feel like people's creative process has changed kind of kind of too without having that schedule i kind of enjoyed um the freedom to just be like yeah when it when it strikes me when it strikes me and then most of the time i was just like i'm not doing anything either so yeah um, same with x it was it was it was so easy with exercise too i'd be like you know, I'd put a yoga mat down in the living room on, on the living room floor. And if I was mm -hmm. watching some movie or some TV series or put down my book or whatever it was, or practicing guitar and like, you know, I'd be like, okay, I need a break from this. And there's the yoga mat. I'd be like, I'd do some sit-ups or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the title of this is going to be just Joshua Raiden gets ripped during pandemic. Uh, uh, totally. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, uh, we were, when you were doing the zoom, you just did, did a lot of live zoom stuff. That's the same way with comedy too. We did a lot of live zoom shows or whatever. Uh, did you find that that's something you'd want to continue after everybody kind of opened? I mean, we're doing this now and stuff or whatever, but do you feel like it's a new avenue for you to go down? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to do it as much. I mean, I, I really right. love the live show, um, mm -hmm. like in a, in a theater, you know, looking at people and really, yeah, there's not, there's nothing obviously that can, that can take the place of that. But, um, uh but yeah i mean i think for special occasions you know if people mm -hmm. you know write me an email and someone writes me an email there were a lot of people that were you know i i played a couple weddings on zoom like from my living room not wearing oh, wow. pants you know like you know sh you know w chest up you know sitting there <laughs> yeah. and like and i'm looking out on zoom over this entire you know wedding happening and this first dance is happening and people are crying, whatever. And I'm like, all right, I mean, I'll, I'll do that for a half an hour. Like, uh, people have been asking me to play weddings for 15 years. And I'm always like, no, I'm, I'm not going to go to your wedding. I don't know you. I'm not going to go to some person's wedding. I don't know. But if, right. you can sit in your, but if you can sit in your living room and play someone their first dance song, it's so meaningful to, to them. It was like, all right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it, was, it felt, uh, felt kind of special. So yeah. those kind of things, you know, maybe I'll, incorporate into uh into the yeah um, that sort right. of thing and now you're in europe now right yes i'm in a in a hotel room in stockholm sweden at the moment awesome dude and how uh are you doing you're doing live gigs no live gigs haven't really opened up uh for americans i mean i think there's might be some live gigs outdoor for some people but no booking agents uh were willing to book any american artists over here um until until like january which is okay. um, when my next tour will start so uh except it is weird though like i'm i'm flying back to new york uh, on uh, f this coming weekend august uh, 7th mm -hmm. saturday night i'm playing my first live show wow. in the hamptons um and it's this little tiny little venue that uh, 
that I play every summer just as an excuse to go out to the Hamptons and have it paid for. <laughs> so, uh, um, but it's like, uh, it, you know, it's, it only holds maybe like 150, 200 people or something like that. And it's a great little place, a uh, classic little venue. And uh, everyone, in order to buy tickets, everyone had to prove vac- they were vaccinated. Nice. Um, I, it, it wasn't even my choice. That was just like the venue's um, right. thing. But I was like, okay, cool. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to see my mom. For the, she's flying in from Cleveland for the first time. And I haven't seen her since the world shut down. So, uh, so I'm going to see her, which is That's awesome. That's incredible. That's yeah. so nice, man. Yeah, we finally got to see family. I just saw like my that. dad for the first time, like, uh, before oh. I came over to Europe. And, you know, it's like, it's emotional after not seeing your parents for a year and a half. It, it, yeah, man, it has to be. And same thing, like, my, it's one of those things that you didn't even realize, like, you know, it took that kind of shit for granted because that's, that's the thing that I, you know, totally. you know, you see your family all the time or whatever, and you're like, oh my God. And then after not having them for the holidays and then having a year and a half go by and then finally seeing them again, I didn't expect it to hit me as hard as it did, but it did. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I feel things. That's so nice to know. <laughs> Cause after a while, you're just like, I'm dead inside. Um, <laughs> right. You're just like, eh, it's whatever. Um, <laughs> well, when you, yeah, if you're living with your mom though, during the pandemic, obviously it, it then it becomes little... just, it's just, just becomes, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's she's wallpaper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it, she's she's is, the like... loveliest wallpaper in the world. <laughs> yeah. 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 You expect to miss your parents or your mother or whatever. And then like, but you're like, wow, I actually have, an emotional side for extended family. That's so good to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's cool, man. So you went to, I, I was reading about, you know, just doing some research, uh, whatever. You started off as an, you were, you were an art student when you went to school. Yeah. Was that not, so was music not initially what you wanted to go into, like in the beginning when you were younger and stuff? Was that not uh, something, did you want to be I just like did, an artist? I didn't, I didn't grow up playing any music. You know, I didn't grow up playing any instruments or anything. I mean, it was just always seems like, so that, I mean, I was left to like sing in the shower and you know in the car, but <laughs> like everybody, yeah. But, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. I, I was never the person who wanted to be on stage or in uh, in a, in front of a spotlight or anything like that. I, I I was very shy from like that sort of attention. I always mm-hmm. wanted to be an artist in some way, uh, do something creative, but behind the scenes and then show your work. You know, mm. um, that's a good way to put it. So, so yeah, so I don't know. I just, as much as I would dream of, I, all I ever wanted to do was go to concerts and especially in college and high school, I just spent all my money on like CDs and, and going and concert tickets. And, uh, but I, you know, I'd sit there in the audience I'd stand there and look up at the stage and at these people on stage and be like, wow, you know, like, how could you ever do that? You know? And, um, yeah. Uh, not only how could you do what you're doing and write these songs and play these songs so well, and um, but have the balls to do it in front of all these people. And uh, so, yeah, it, even when I started playing songs, it had nothing, I, not, never in my mind was I like, oh yeah, one of these days I'm going to play these songs for people. Wow. Can you remember the moment when you decided like, okay, this is what I actually want to do, like the transition from that to music? Yeah, I mean, I wrote, when I was 30, I got a guitar, um, learned a few chords, learned a few cover songs, mm-hmm. and uh, just sitting around the couch in my apartment. I was living in New York at the time. And um, yeah, and I, I would use the guitar playing, learning a chord or learning a finger pattern um, as a meditative device because I was trying to be a screenwriter at that time. And so if I was stuck on a scene or some bit of dialogue. I was like, I can't decide what this character has to say or something like that. I'd be stuck. I would just pick up the guitar and, and just strum away, you know, and maybe um, learn a new chord. It it was like my cathartic meditation. Uh, It was like my, it was like very therapeutic for me. So, and it would open my mind in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then all of a sudden, maybe an hour later, um, without thinking about it, you know, the line would come to me or so, it's interesting to me, and I tell this all the time to people, like when they ask, if, if they ask for it, it's not like I'm shouting out advice to people. But, um, <laughs> On the balcony, you know, 9 a.m. every morning. It's yeah, like, this is how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell is that guy's problem? <laughs> um, but, you know, over the years after shows, there's so many like younger songwriters or artists that will ask you questions and like, how do you, mm-hmm. you know, 
um, do you have any advice or, you know, things like that. And then, you know, I, I do. Um, and I'm, I'm always yeah. happy, happy to give it. I don't know if it'll work for them, but it worked for me. So, um, that one of those pieces of advice I like to give is a lot of times people, when they're thinking creatively, at least I did, I'd be so locked in on something and it, it would, you know, some people maybe go for a run or some people mm -hmm. jump in the ocean or some people, you know, do something that frees their brain up. And then all of a sudden they go for a long walk or talk to a friend or sit in a coffee shop and just look at people, you know, whatever it is for me, it was opening up my, my creative brain in some other way, you know, learning how to play guitar that would open up that all of a sudden it would open up a, a different window. Um, the, another window that I needed to be open. Yeah. Um, another piece of advice uh, that I always give people starting out when it comes to if they specifically want to do what I do and they've never played guitar or anything, I'm always like, your first buy your first guitar, uh, make sure it's twice as expensive as the guitar you can actually afford. Wow. What, what, so why is that? Because then you'll be like if because then you'll um, you'll really love that guitar and you'll be guilted every time you see it in like sitting in your living room on the stand, you'll be like, I'm going to pick that thing up. I mean, I, yeah. You know? um, so if you can only afford a hundred dollar acoustic guitar, buy one that's $200. That's you know? brilliant. I never thought of it like that before, but that's a really great way to do it. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it forced me to like every time it was my favorite possession. It was like this only my only possession. I'm not a big mm -hmm. person when it comes to like things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I like, I learned very early on that things don't make me happy. Um, but my guitar was like, it was like, Good. oh my God, if there was a fire, I'd grab this thing, you know? Um, <laughs> wow. So every time it would be, and also don't keep it in the case. Oh, that's just, just have it right there, right, you know, yeah. right there. So anytime you feel like you, you're forced to look at it all the time and you're like, I got to play that thing. It, it, it costs twice as much as I should have spent. <laughs> right. <laughs> it explains why I'm not good. I have a banjo that somebody gave to me, which is now I feel like explains why I'm not. But a lot of people that have that. A, a lot of people have that thing. There's always in everyone's apartment or house. There's always like a guitar standing up in the corner, whether it's mm -hmm. to make you look cool or whether it's to, you know, someone gave it to you or someone left it there or something, but it hasn't right. been taken care of and it sounds like shit. And like, mm -hmm. it just never makes you want to pick it up. Like you have to have, if you really want to do it, the instrument you have has has to be something you want to pick up every time you look at it and make sure you're looking at it. It's not the guitar case closed, locked up. is not going to make you want to right. open it up and look at it. And Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember your first paid gig? Like the first time you went out and actually got money for doing it? Yeah, I do. Um, it was at a place called the Hotel Cafe Ooh. in, in uh, Hollywood, California. Mm-hmm. And how, was it uh, like, I mean, was it, was it one of the, like, were you, did you feel like, cause I feel like sometimes when people go out to get their first paid gig, they're like, one, they're just like amazing that somebody's paying them to do their work. But at that point, did you feel like you were established enough to do it? Or were you just like, I'm fucking so lucky. <laughs> well, man, I had the weirdest story, you know, like it's just so anytime I ever tell this story to someone who's asking like an interview or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. they're, they're just like, what, <laughs> well, what? Um, so it was just, it's, it's hard to explain, but you know, I spent the first 30 years of my life trying to be a, an artist in some way, painting mm -hmm. or screenwriting, or I was an art teacher for kids for a while, uh, you know, um, and I was always seeking an audience mm -hmm. doing whatever I was doing. This music was the first thing where the audience came to me. And that's what, because it was just so natural and organic that it made me just go, all right, this is what I'm doing. I'm mm -hmm. never looking back. I've been doing the starving artist thing for so long um, right. that uh, you don't look. It. And then this little hobby I picked up, never thinking it would ever make me money. Um, right. Was the first thing that was like money just started coming to me. And I was like, what? You know, or I mean, it was back in the day when uh, I mean, this was 17 years ago. So. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, well, okay, this is what happened. I'll, I'll try to make it somewhat succinct. But uh, 
Well, maybe I don't. I mean, it, we have 40 more minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever you want to do. And then, <laughs> yeah, you can tell, uh, you can make it as okay. long and embellished as you so, want. It's cool because okay. I love that your experience came from, sorry, not to even inter interrupt, but I kind of like just the juxtaposition of like you were totally involved in another kind of uh, part of your brain doing like basically, were you painting or was it what kind of? Uh, I know like, I was, I was on to more screenwriting and, and trying to sell screenplays. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Because it was like your brain's working on that kind of stuff. And through that, you actually found a whole other creative way to express yourself, which is, I feel like not everyone's story. You know what I mean? Like, uh, no, for you know, sure. Not. Normally it's one or the other, man. Normally somebody's working a boring job and then they get to the creative field. You were just working on two different types of creativity. Yeah. And then, well, a v visual art and then writing, but even yeah. screenwriting is you 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 they say, you know, um, you still have to think visually. You, you, you show, don't tell in a screenplay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's the spine of a film. It's not, um, you, you, anyway, you, you, you're not really supposed to editorialize so much like you would in a right. novel, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, you wouldn't say like, uh, James, uh, looks like he's, um, anxious. You mm -hmm. would say James furrows his brow. It's an action rather than right. Like show it, like don't tell it. Mm -hmm. So I was always thinking visually, whether it was painting or, um, or, or or writing. I wrote six, you know, feature length scripts, and mm -hmm. so it was like the writing and the painting, and you know, it kind of all fused into one when I started writing songs because all my songs, I tend to think visually, so I I tend to describe. In the lyrics, I, I tend to describe um, things that I'm looking at, or you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Which is an, uh, another reason, probably, so many songs were put in TV shows and films, and you know, used with a visual uh, media because mm -hmm. maybe they they paired well that way, or I, I don't know. But anyway, they, well, yeah, the, I mean, they the, the absolutely point, the, do. My point being is that when I started, uh, I, I you know, everyone has connections, or not everybody has connections, but I mean, mm -hmm. someone they might know, or you know. So my best friend. Uh, the, uh, is a actor, director, writer named Zach Braff. He yep. was a star of that show, Scrubs. Scrubs, great. I, one of my all-time top five favorite shows, by the way. Oh, cool. Yeah, grew up on Scrubs. S S well, he's a Jersey guy too. Yes. Um, so he uh, he was. Uh, we used to give each other notes on our screenplays when we were both like you know waiting tables and mm -hmm. um, and uh, so. I wrote my first song um, after about, I don't know, six months of picking up the guitar and learning a few chords. Wow. Um, just, you know, I was going through a breakup. I was living with this girl in my apartment in the East Village in New York for like six years. And I didn't know, it was my first real relationship. And I didn't know how to tell her that it was, I wasn't really, she wasn't my person. You know, I was like mm -hmm. really stuck and stressed and didn't know how to break up with her because I loved her, but I just didn't want to be with her anymore. Is this the song Closer? No, it's, it's a song called Winter. Oh, Winter, Winter's Yes. Okay, that makes... Okay, gotcha. That, so that was I the first song. I love that one too, yeah. I think Closer may have been like the third song I ever wrote, but Winter was like the first song I wrote. Anyway, so I write this song. Um, I, didn't pl I hadn't played it for anyone. And uh, Z Zach was in my apartment and he sees a guitar sitting there. And he's mm -hmm. like, whose guitar is that? And I was like, it's mine. Uh I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to learn and um, I just, I wrote my first song and he was like, oh, play it for me. And I was like, no way. <laughs> uh, I was way, way too shy. Even with my best friend, I was way too shy. Right. So finally he convinces me and I'm like, okay, you got to turn around though. Um, Cause there's no way I can like, you know, play it if you're looking at me, that's, you know. <laughs> um, so he turns around and then I, I play the song. And uh, he turns around and he's got like glassy eyes. He's like tears in his eyes. And I was like, whoa, uh, what a response. What a reaction. And mm -hmm. he's, I've always respected his, um, his, uh, his artistic sensibility and his, uh, his taste. And anyway, we, the first time we met, we just started, our, our, Annie Hall is our favorite, both of our favorite film. And we just started quoting back and forth every, every line from the movie. And it was like, it was like in Step Brothers when they're like, did we just become best friends? You know, was, <laughs> and that's pretty that's much awesome. what happened. And then we were best friends ever since. And um, so anyway, uh, 
I basically, uh, he said, you know, I think they were in about maybe the third season of Scrubs by then. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, you got to record a demo of that song because Bill, Bill Lawrence, the creator Lawrence. of the show, the executive producer of the show, mm -hmm. he's a big music fan. And he was like, they're always looking for new music to put in, in the episodes because back then you couldn't have TV shows and movies. They couldn't afford, uh, like a Paul Simon song, you know, that right, might've right, cost, right. that might've cost like a million bucks. Whereas mm -hmm. they were always looking for newer artists that kind of had the similar sound to maybe a song that they wanted in the show, but couldn't afford or. Right. And uh, that song winter had a very, you know, had a, a similar vibe to, to maybe a Paul Simon song, at least with the vocals and, um, or an Elliot Smith or a Nick Drake or yeah. all the art, all the, all my favorite kind of artists that I was listening to all the time back then. And then still am. Mm -hmm. uh but uh so i was like okay whatever and so i i i went into my buddy's bedroom he had like mm -hmm. a little pro tools rig on his imac and just a, a, a mic and and an imac basically that was it uh, nice. and uh and i played the song live and then i sang a harmony over it and uh sent the demo to bill lawrence mm -hmm. you know not really thinking anything of it it's just I was just being like, Zach told me to do it. So, all right. <laughs> and like three weeks later, Bill, I get an email from, uh, from Bill and he's like, what's your phone number? And I sent back my phone where he calls me and he said, I I've been looking for this one spot uh, to, for a song. I can't find the song that fits perfectly. Your song winter fits perfectly. C can we use it? And I was like, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I got to think on it. Right. <laughs> and I was like, you know, my hands are shaking. I'm like, what now? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then like a week later it aired in the, in the show. And, and incredible. what, what ended up being like out of so many seasons of that show that aired all over the world, what ended mm -hmm. up being like, it's people's huge scrubs fans, like their favorite, mo most memorable moment of the series yeah, and it it crashed the NBC website after it aired from so many people trying to figure out where to get that song. Wow, which obviously I was so humbled by. Um, yeah, but uh, having it be my first song, whatever. Uh, so that was a, this light bulb moment where I was like, I, I, clearly this is what I should be doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so it really came out of a demand. The rest of my songs, it was like, well, if people want to hear more. So my buddy that I went in to do the demo in his room with, he was kind of better. I'm terrible with tech or I, I have, mm -hmm. I'm an analog. I, I like to say I'm basically an analog guy in a digital world. Um, <laughs> so, so basically uh, he was like, you got to get a MySpace page and, and put oh, the wow. song up there. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay. And so he came over and he made me a MySpace page and this is a very long, drawn-out answer, but I'm getting around to the answer. Oh, this to is answer great, your, man. To, this is the kind of detail your, we like. <laughs> to answer your question. It's just, just, it's just a unique, bizarre story, so I thought you might mm -hmm. want to know. Anyway, so he makes me a MySpace page. And back then, I'm sure people listening to this don't even remember what MySpace was, but uh, it was before, right before Facebook. Yeah, uh, it was a calmer Facebook, I feel I, like. Whatever, it, but it was, you know, there's a lot of music on it. You yeah, know, it was, totally. And it, even not even not just for musicians, but it was like people would their their page you'd click on their MySpace page. Like you would have they would have a song of that they one song like their default song, and it would it would be playing while you'd be looking through their photos or their what they're about or whatever. Mm -hmm. And back then, you could you could go on. I kind of found like a little life hack, and it was like I've always been really good at finding little life hacks. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's at the airport or whether, you know, whatever it is, like <laughs> getting, getting around things that most people don't see. Yeah. Um, and everybody maybe, needs a maybe getting like that, a, maybe, maybe getting a better grade in, in, you know, in, in junior high, knowing like that the teacher wanted you to say this, you know, it's just always mm -hmm. like kind of, I guess I was always seeing the angles in a way. Yeah. So there was this thing on MySpace, a feature where you could just search anyone who liked a certain kind of music. Or, so I would just go, and you could just say anyone within, so I was gonna go out to LA. Mm -hmm. I, I booked myself a gig at the Hotel Cafe, mm -hmm. which was this brand new 
tiny little singer songwriter haunt maybe hold, held like 90 people people would sit on the floor but my my friend was already out there he's a musician and he was playing there all the time and he was like he took me to it when i went out to la to pitch some of my scripts and i just fell in love with the place i was like I, this is my favorite bar ever i'm never gonna go i'll go here every night right listening to people play you know it was really just acoustic singer songwriters and uh and was telling stories and smoking cigarettes in the alley and you know, just a huge community. It, it just started, it was a very tiny community at that point, but it was about to be very big community to, that started a lot of artists' careers. Um, it was almost like the first, you know, like SNL in the beginning, like all those, right, right. you know, it, wow. it was, we, that's what we like to call it in the beginning. It was like uh, not yet ready for primetime players. Like the, uh, <laughs> so for us, it was like not yet ready to headline. So it was like people <laughs> looking to, it was like, it was like artists looking to hop on like as support acts, opening acts for other, for bigger acts who, who were headlining. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so uh, I had like long story short, too late. <laughs> uh, this is perfect, so, man. So I'm going out to, I book a gig. My friend helps me book a gig at Hotel Cafe. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I get on MySpace for like two weeks in my kitchen in New York. Mm -hmm. Just trying to add friends. That's what you would do on MySpace. Add friend, yeah. add friend. But I would only add friends, like request friends, you know, friendship from people who were within a hundred mile radius of the Hotel Cafe. Wow. And, and in their music, you know, people would, on MySpace would list all the bands and artists that they listen to. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, type in if you, you know, anyone 100 miles away from the Hotel Cafe who has listed that they like Paul Simon, Bob Dylan, Nick Drake, Elliot Smith, James Taylor, Cat Stevens, Joni Mitchell, Carol King, Neil Young, like all the acoustic like singer songwriters. Right. And then they would just pop up. It would just lists of all these people who loved that kind of music. They wrote, they loved that kind of music and they mm -hmm. all lived a hundred miles, at least a hundred, some live you know, a mile from, but within a hundred miles. And I would just sit there and go, add friend, add friend, add friend, add friend, add friend all day. Wow. So by the time I got out to the hotel cafe, the show was sold out and it was my first concert ever. Holy shit. And I step into the hotel cafe with my guitar and mm -hmm. the owner, the owners uh, were named, their name Max and Marco. Mm -hmm. They were like, dude, what is going on? I don't understand. Uh, we thought we were doing you a favor, <laughs> give, give, giving, giving you a gig. And every, there's a line out the door around the corner of wow. longer than, you know, more people that could fit in mm -hmm. who were all my MySpace friends, <laughs> like who had, who had just listened to my one song winter right. on and and uh they were like and I, I didn't tell anyone i was i did i didn't tell them i did this right 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 of course i was just like no man i don't know i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> oh my god and then what? uh and then so i just started playing they were like will you play here every week and i was like sure <laughs> and every week i'd play uh i would um they would always back there was back then they had people uh, music supervisors who back then mm -hmm. had become the new radio DJs because wow. no one was listening to radio anymore. They were just, you know, everyone was getting their new music from commercials and movies and TV shows and, yeah. um, and then downloading it on iTunes, but this was before streaming. Yeah. So, um, or, or just listening to it on was it know, Napster, Napster, listening to it on Napster. Oh, Napster. Yeah, man. Oh God. I got so many, so much music from Napster. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the songwriter's like, uh, yeah, yeah, you do, yeah. I, I know. I, 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 as, I, as I said that, I was like, oh, I probably couldn't. Have. Yeah, 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 I was in high school. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I'm <laughs> yeah, kidding. Yeah. I had an I had a Napster account too. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, every so I would write a song. I'd go into my buddy's uh, bedroom and I'd record it, uh, like a little demo, and uh, very, you know, bare bones. Met this girl mm -hmm. who named Priscilla on at the hotel cafe, and she had a love, like a beautiful voice, and she, uh, she would sing harmonies on the songs, yeah. and uh, and uh, I would burn a CD of the demo, mm -hmm. maybe like two, two or three, 
of the song I'd, it would be in a car in the parking lot and i'd go play the show and i'd every i'd play mostly covers i didn't have you know originals so i had like by that time maybe i had a few originals i'd written but every week i'd i'd write a i'd bring a demo of a new song nice. to the show and i'd premiere it at the show mm -hmm. and uh invariably some music supervisor from some tv show or movie you know Grey's Anatomy, uh, one tree, you know, at One Tree Hill, like any of those shows, they would come up to me after after the end of the show, and they'd say that that new song you said you just wrote, you don't happen to have a demo of it, and I'd be like, I do, it's in the car, <laughs> um, and I'd give them the demo, and then like a week later they'd call and they'd be like, can we put this in Grey's Anatomy, and I'd be like, yes, oh, um, wow, and it was like every week it seemed one of my songs was in a TV show, and so now now we're getting. You know, so you asked me about my first live show, like what was it like to get paid? And it was like, by that time, you know, by the first few shows, I mean, I was definitely making more money from, you know, licensing my new songs to like Grey's Anatomy or, you know, yeah. than I was by selling 90 tickets, you know, to a, to a concert. Um, That's the great, this is the greatest answer we've ever had to this question, by the way. Well, I told you it was going to be a long, drawn-out answer. It, but it was, like, amazing. Every part of it is, like, I mean, most people are like, yeah, it was a, you know, craft gig, and, you know, I you know, <laughs> I had to fight the guy for the money. <laughs> yeah. yours, yours, yours immediately goes into licensing stuff. That's incredible. Yeah, so I, I it was just a very – it was a timing thing. It was, like, the licensing boom, like the gold mm -hmm. rush in L.A., in Hollywood. <laughs> All the musicians from New York the fled New York. Um, because everyone at that time wow. was just trying, every band you'd see was just trying to be the Strokes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, the acoustic singer-songwriter thing was happening in the, the Hotel Cafe. Like, it, that, wow. it was, there was a resurgence of that, of, that, of that thing. So everyone, and then also, it was not only that, but then it was like, oh, wait a second, music supervisors are hanging out at the Hotel Cafe looking for new artists that they can afford to put in their, in their mm -hmm. shows. And very quickly, I just became like the most licensed artist. Uh, I don't know on certain network, like certainly on ABC. Um, but uh, yeah. it was like every week for like I don't know, ten years. Some song of mine was in something. Absolutely. Uh, well, that's what it feels like, man. That's like it's it's the craziest thing because um, that's why people know my music. It wasn't like I, yeah. you know they'd be like, oh, I had this. It was a K rock hit, you know, like. Mm -hmm. and, constantly playing after a Beyonce song or, you know, was, right. I wasn't, go, I wasn't <laughs> going on the road opening for like the stones or something, you know, it was like, right. Uh, it was basically just like every week someone would be trying to remember a lyric that they heard and it was before Shazam. Mm -hmm. So they would have to remember a lyric yeah, and, and Google it. And, mm -hmm. and that would make them feel ownership. They had to work to hear me. They had to work to find me. And that's kind of one of the things I loved. And I think my friends and I still kind of like our, our generation at least kind of holds on to that too, because that's the way we share music. Like it's very like kind of uh, uh, like, a, oop, did I lose you? I think I lost him. He'll come back in, I'm sure. <laughs> I think he hit the, hit the button. This is the second time this has happened this week. So Josh will be back momentarily. <laughs> um, there he is. Hello. Oh, I don't know what happened. I, yeah, I think you may have accidentally hit the exit studio button. It's fine. Somebody else did that the other day. I didn't even touch the phone. That's so weird. Oh, it was propped so up against my iPad. Oh, well, never mind. Sorry. Oh, wow. Well. No, that's right. Um, I would know what, uh, but I was saying, like, that's the kind of thing, like, my friends and I still do to this day, but like, the way we share music is like, you worked for it. You know what I mean? Like, we'll hear something and a thing, and then immediately, like, I remember, uh, I kind of introduced my friends, like, to your music at the same time, too, because I was one of those people who well, thank I, you. I heard us. Yeah, no, dude, like when I heard a song I loved, I was like the same thing, lyric, finding it, putting it out there, uh, you know, trying to figure it out. Do you remember like what covers you were playing at the time though? Like, was there something like yeah. your go-to? They were like, I remember there was a, uh, there was a song I heard in a commercial. I was just like you. I mean, I, mm -hmm. even before I started playing, I was like, uh, there was a song, uh, a Nick Drake song called Fly that I heard in, um, in the Royal Tenenbaums. Yes. Um, and, uh, I was like, I got to learn how to play that song. I had, I, the, one of the first songs I learned to play was Elliot Smith's between the bars after hearing it in Goodwill hunting. Oh yeah. That's a great, great song. Um, let's see. The first song I ever learned to play 
was Bob Dylan's Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. And I still play it pretty much almost every concert I play. That's awesome. That's a great song too, man. Um, I love those songs. There's yeah. like, that's, I, I feel like, uh, like I, I like that point in time. I love finding music in stuff because not only if it's, if it's really, if it's a good show or a good movie or whatever it is, you're connecting with the scene, you know, it creates yeah. like an emotional memory. But when the song is amazing, that just beats everything too, because you can just, yeah. you can just listen to it on its own. It comes with its own. Uh, and I feel like that's what your music does too. Like it comes with its own kind of, you know, um, emotion and feeling and and you create your own memories of that song outside of the thing you saw it in yeah i mean i remember this girl i met uh out in the hotel cafe very early on mm -hmm. um and she became a friend and i was like i saw her play and it was like this girl has the best voice i've ever heard um and she was so kooky and fun and like just the most friendly person ever mm -hmm. and uh and then uh, like, I don't know, maybe six months later, one of my favorite series was Six Feet Under. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, and then all of a sudden I hear her song end the entire series, which was probably the best se series finale I've ever seen of, a, of any series. Absolutely. Um, and her song, Breathe Me, it, 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 you know, it was this, she, she, didn't, she didn't get a career. Now her name's Sia. Uh, mm -hmm. but <laughs> but she wasn't at the time at the time she wasn't writing uh huge pop songs for, right. for other artists she was doing her own thing um and she's just insanely insanely talented mm -hmm. uh but she you know and she was doing well but it wasn't you know she was like doing like how i do but mm -hmm. she she had her aspirations for like i want to conquer the world right. um so she was like, you know what? Now I'm going to write Katy Perry a song, and now I'm going to write Rihanna a song, and now I'm going to write Beyonce right. a song, and and, um, and then when that became a thing, then she started doing like her own stuff as well. But you know, so and then she was like, okay, I'm going to be enormous, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like a household name, right? But but you know, that song of hers, "Breathe Me," it, the, the series finale of that show was so well done, mm -hmm. but it, half of it was because of her song. Yes. Uh, if, there, if there's a perfect song to go with, like, that's the, I, one of the things I've always had an interest in, I love uh, finding out who scores something. You know what I mean? Like, 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 uh, like Zach is really good at, I said, Zach, like, I know who he is. Like, I know him personally. I'm like, Zach, you know, your buddy. Um, but like, he's <laughs> like, he's one of those people that I remember growing up, like, if he was scoring a movie or putting a, an album together, I was like, Oh, this is going to be good. Like yeah. I, it fascinates me how people can do that kind of stuff. Well, don't, don't, I mean, you know, it, he it didn't go to his head at all. I mean, the fact that he, <laughs> the fact that he doesn't play music and has a Grammy, like he never, he, right. it's, not, it's not like he doesn't ever rub that in my face. <laughs> Every time I play him a new song, he's like, yeah, I mean, I like that one. I mean, I like the other one more. And I'm like, Oh really? Cause I like this one more. He's like, well, I do have a Grammy. <laughs> uh it's always good to have a friend like that yeah do you are you ever watching like because like you said you've been watched you know all of netflix or if you're watching a series where you're like i could put a song in that or like i know where to put this or put that you like do you, do you kind of do that you're in your own? Of, of course i mean i i chose one of the songs in in one of the scenes in garden state for him oh dude yes i i mean i the it's a nick drake song called mm -hmm. one of these things first and i he was oh, we were watching it and i was like there's a song called one of these things first by nick drake and he's like who's nick drake and i was like here's the song and he goes that's perfect for that and wow. uh so it, you know I, I don't want to take it away that most of the music obviously 95 percent of uh the, the, the that soundtrack he chose the placement he chose the song mm -hmm. you know obviously but yeah i always thought and then when that soundtrack won a uh one that won, won, won a Grammy for, for best uh, original soundtrack. Um, you would see Nick Drake on like topping iTunes charts, even though he'd been dead for 30 years. Right. And all these kids were listening to Nick Drake. And I felt like I had something to do with that. Like yeah. I, I, I was like so proud to bring back one of my favorite artists that no one like knew who Nick Drake was. I mean, I mean, right. music lovers or, you know, older people, but you know, the guy killed himself when he was, I don't know what age, but early twenties or yeah. in, in the seventies. And, 
Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, Volkswagen did use his song Pink Moon in a great commercial. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think a lot of people back then might have uh, uh, heard about him from then. But, mm -hmm. I, I, but I think Garden State came out before that commercial. Um, and I think you're right. And, I, and, and really, like, you you turn on the iTunes charts. If I if I released an album, I'd look to see you know where my album came out. And it would always be like Nick Drake was right there, having been dead for so long. And I was like, yeah, it's because it's because all these like fifteen year olds are being like, oh, I love Nick Drake now, you know, was, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Rather than a bunch of fifteen year olds being like, I love this new pop star that's an idiot, and you know, yes. Like, Dude, I can I completely agree. I couldn't wrap my head around like half of my you know well, graduating class when we were in high school. Like listening, to, I'd be like, I was one of the same people who would be like, oh my god, like you got to listen to this guy. He's got so much depth. Like there's so much stuff going on. You got to read the lyrics. I would I used to be one of those people who would show people the lyrics for like to be like, do you understand like what's going on? Then they could yeah. listen to the song. <laughs> Me too, man. I mean, why? Did, that's why Bob Dylan was always my favorite. You know, it was yeah, like, man. You you didn't even have to listen to the song. You just read the poetry. Yes. It's so crazy to me. Like, I love uh, I, when people talk about going to see Bob Dylan with like, man, he didn't do, uh, you know, or, or like, you know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You're he seeing can, Bob. Yeah, he can. Are you got, insane? The dude invented music. He can do whatever yeah. he wants. Oh, I know. I know. It's, I love, it's you, like going to a, it? it's like going to a Picasso exhibit and being like, they didn't have Guernica. <laughs> like okay but they had a million other of his paintings like the dude reinvented painting so yes like, i know it's wild man have you seen any of the documentary uh that they put on uh like the one scorsese did for it was, i think it was released I've, over I've, the pandemic i mean i've seen every yeah every every piece of video footage there is uh, yeah Bob man Dylan. It's cool. I like how they've kind of like, because uh, I wasn't, I, w I didn't know what to expect when Scorsese was doing a, a documentary on it, right? But I like that he kind of embraced uh, like the weirdness of Bob, you know what I mean? Like I felt like I was actually kind of watching. Well, most of the, that documentary, most of the great footage he, mm -hmm. Scorsese used that is from other documentaries that came out long ago. Oh, like really? The, like, I didn't know like, that. Like the D.A. Pennebaker stuff. Um, yeah. That, that stuff, that footage was like insanely cool but I, you know mm -hmm. that's been out that's been out forever uh oh see i didn't know that oh yeah go check that out like i will go, yeah. google google da pennebaker and dylan and um and and uh that there, there's footage in there it was like there's one scene where um dylan it's in like i can't remember maybe 65 66 mm -hmm. when he was riding around with dylan and dylan was going to like uh london playing like Royal Albert Hall and he's riding around in, in the back of a taxi, one of those big black taxis or a limo with, uh, with John Lennon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Dylan's really like bugging out on drugs and, and John Lennon's just so annoyed with him. It's just like, <laughs> uh, but that kind of footage, you're like, who has that kind of footage? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, is there, did you get to, that one, is there anybody that, 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 it's called Don't Look Back. That's the, Don't uh, Look Back. Okay. Yeah. The Pennebaker. That's the best uh, documentary ever made about uh, Dylan. I'll definitely check that out. Thank you. There's, there's scene in where he's like, he's in a party room, like in, in a hotel room, and Donovan, he's meeting Donovan for the oh, first time. Nice. And they're passing around guitars, and everyone's like telling Bob Dylan, like, yeah, Donovan is like the, the Europe, the European version of you. And so you, you could see, you know, sort of like, Dil you know, Dylan's like, ah, well, yeah. and D <laughs> Donovan, Donovan plays a song and, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then, but Donovan's a big fan of Dylan. And he's like, he asks him to play, um, uh, what's the song, the Dylan song he asked him to play. I'm blanking on the title. I'm just, uh, uh. Anyway, Dylan plays it. And you could see my friend who, while I was watching it with, uh, years ago, she's an artist and she goes, man, you never want to be the Donovan in the room. <laughs> like, as, as, like as good as Donovan is, I mean, he's classic. Like he's amazing. Right. But like, I mean, he's just it, in the whole room is just after Dylan plays this song, you know, it's, you know, everyone's yeah. kind of looking at Donovan just like, man, you are nothing compared to this dude. <laughs> That's fucking amazing. Yeah. You never want to be the Donovan in the room. That's such a great line. Yeah. 
Do you still get like a like a little starstruck when you meet like have you worked with somebody that you were ever like kind of intimidated to work with? Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely Jim Keltner. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah, I do. That's awesome. Uh, you're, 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 was that early you're, in your career? Or? That was on a record of mine called Underwater. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. That might have been my fourth album. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's my favorite drummer of all time. So, I mean, he was, besides Ringo, he was George Harrison's favorite drummer. So, it's mm -hmm. like. <laughs> it's weird that uh, you just said that. I, I mean, George watching. Harrison was like the president of the Jim Keltner fan club. I was like. Right. That's all you need. That's all your listeners who don't know who Jim. Jim Keltner played drums on. Um, uh, uh, let's see. What else? He played drums on. Um, knocking on Heaven's Door. Mm, okay. Uh, with Dylan. Uh, he played. Uh, I mean, he's, he's just the king. He's the king. Yeah. So working with him was incredible. And he was the most humble, kindest man. Um, ben Montench. That's the only wow. time I ever teared up in the studio. Wow. Listening to him play on one of my songs. And now we're buddies. We, he literally, he, I never like buddies, like we don't hang out, but, right, um, right. but like I was in Italy a couple weeks ago and his wife is Italian and they're living in Italy right now too. Um, and, uh, he was like, just constant messages from him. Have you checked out this restaurant? Have you, and I'm just oh. like, every time my phone, my Instagram DM lights up and it's like Ben Montench, I'm like, I, I still have to like pinch myself. Like, yeah. I don't know if your listeners are, are, are that's, um, he was the, the keyboardist in uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, which is mm -hmm. one of my favorite, which is, I mean, I love Tom Petty to death. He's one of my favorite artists of all time, but yeah. the Heartbreakers is definitely like, as a, a rock and roll band, I mean, it's like, you, you can't kind of get better than that. Yeah. It's so cool when somebody you admire actually winds up, like you said, like he messages you every now and again, and you're just like. Now it's like constantly when it's about a when it's about Italy. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. Do you, do you, like, I'm one of those people who like, I, I've talked to like, um, do you know, um, uh, Megan Cavanaugh, she was, uh, she was in League of Their Own and, um, you know. Um, Sounds familiar. Uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. And she was Marla Hooch in League of Their Own. And, so she and I were talking about it uh, at one point. We're like, you know, we, we wound up getting along and we wound up talking or whatever. And she's like, you got to keep in touch. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, no, I mean it. And then I was just like, yeah. And then she was like, are you one of those people who like people say that and you don't do it? And I'm like, yeah, because <laughs> like, I just don't know if anybody wants to hear from me. <laughs> like it's just, such, it's, especially when they're like, you know, when it's somebody that you've known forever from a distance. <laughs> You don't know if people are full of shit. You know what I mean? You're just like, yeah, absolutely. And it's oddly enough, she's like, when people do that, I'm like, I'm always so grateful when they do it first. I'm like, oh, you actually want to talk? Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Then I'll then I'll reach out. But otherwise, I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> that's cool. She was like, that's I feel cool. like I've had so many missed opportunities where like I should have kept in touch with people just just because they're just awesome to know. And I'm like, I know what you mean. But I'm yeah. always one of those people who like, I'm like, I've met them once, and they probably don't want to see me again. <laughs> no, I don't know if it. I'm sure it's not that. You know, I'm just, I, I feel the same way. I never want to like encroach on people's. Right. I mean, I, the the record Benmont and Keltner and I did together was like, I don't know how many years ago, but it, God, I don't know, eight years ago maybe. And now it's finally me and Benmont are like writing each other a bunch. Nice. That's eight, it took eight years before I was like, can I, can I, can I even like one of his pictures? Like, can I even? Like... <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it all becomes like a high school crush where you're like, I don't yeah. want to seem too needy. Yeah, but yeah, but I, so I'm, I'm 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 the same way too. It's like, yeah, I feel like we all are for some reason, and we just can't get over that hump. We should just acknowledge the fact that we're all awkward to a certain extent. Totally. But we all want to be like, no, 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 you're busy. I'm busy. Even though I'm not busy, I'm just staring at my phone. Like, <laughs> But I think as a, as a general rule of thumb, I think it's like the more successful person has to be the one to reach out. Completely agree. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, because like, otherwise they think you're trying to get something from them or they want, you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. No, I know exactly what you mean. It, it, it becomes, it, plus you get in your own head about it too. And it just winds up being awkward anyway. Like you don't even mean it to be, but you say something really stupid. And it's like, I don't want to do that. Exactly. Because I've met people and, you know, we're friendly, we stay in touch, mm -hmm. and then they became super, super famous. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like, I don't want to be one of those guys who's hitting you up. And because I'm sure everybody in the world is now that 
you know, you yeah. can do something for them or whatever. So I just like, hey, if you ever, you know, uh, in my mind, I'm like, if you ever contact me, great. But if not, that, you know, I'm not going right. to be the one who's like, hey, now you're, you know, now you're Bradley Cooper. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember that time we had that great night? We went to the bars and we're like, and I got you into that bar before you were famous. And, <laughs> you know, like, now, yeah. you know, like, I'm going to be like, hey, bud, like, now, uh, what about using one of my songs in one of your movies? <laughs> no way. Yeah, you know, like, no way. You're still Guardians 3. Come on, dude. Rock, right, Rocket right, needs a theme. Like, yeah, like, nah, not, not, you know, when people become superstars, you just, I just yeah. assume, I just assume, you know, the, the ball's in their court. Yeah. And it's got to be weird, though, too. Like, I, I, I always wonder how many people are watching, like, when they do, an, when, when some of those superstars do, like, an interview, like, 30 years later. And they're like, yeah, man, I had this really close friend. And then they just stop talking to me. I don't understand why. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, I always imagine, like, that friend being on the couch, like, oh, come on. <laughs> are you kidding me? I didn't know you wanted to hear from me. <laughs> I, had, I had it was so it was such a weird thing and probably like not the greatest question to ask at the time but i was talking to carl gottlieb the guy who wrote jaws mm. and he was super you know they were he was best friends with spielberg or whatever and i kind of asked him like he, he it was so weird because he had gotten a phone call he's one of those guys that i like early on in the pandemic when people weren't sure how to do this so we got a phone call and he literally just answered it in the middle of the interview <laughs> You know, I was like, I, which I just thought was like endearing and like really funny because we just kind of paused for a second. Was it was, like, was it from Spielberg? I, it's what I'd asked. And it was oh, oddly yeah. enough, it was from somebody who was in Jaws, right? He oh. wouldn't say it was like one of the one of the uh, character or whatever it was, but they remained friends, which was totally bizarre. So right. she, it was cool. And he put her on speaker for like a second. But then I was like, well, I was like, if you get a call from Spielberg, just let me know. And we'll, you know. And he was like, I don't think I'll be getting a call from Spielberg. And I was like, why? You know, and then he answered it. But he was like, well, he, he put it very nicely. But he was like, uh, he's like, well, you know, and he's like, at a certain point, you know, uh, you also don't have a yacht that you can join him on. Right. <laughs> I was like, I never thought of it like that. But I was like, right. he's like, yeah, he goes, I don't get to just go to Aspen uh, with him and Tom Hanks at a moment's notice. And I was like, oh, right. interesting. Right. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. I Dude, I've, I've kept you for a little over an hour. I got one more question, if that's cool with you. Of course. Awesome. Uh, I ask everybody this. It's like a staple now of the show. If you had um, basically, if you could go back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice that would help you today, something that, you know, would just, would that you wish you had known, what would it be? Uh it would it wouldn't have anything to do with my career it would have to do with personal relationships with women mm -hmm. um and i would tell myself if it doesn't feel perfectly amazingly right to both of you right away mm -hmm. move on wow that's I, I feel like that's awesome too because that's like a lot i feel like a lot of your music and your song come from that place yeah, I mean, I have a song on this new album called Make It Easy that I wrote mm -hmm. uh, sort of like I, I'm beyond the, the, the I'm, I'm too old to be like, you know, is this going to happen? Is this not going to happen? Is this uh, like it's like the, all my friends that are in relationships that are like the unicorn type relationships that they're just so in love after all this time. And, you know, all of them are like we knew right away. Yeah. That's that's a solid piece of advice, and I also feel like I should uh, also take some of that too because I'm I'm a single dude, and at this point I've resigned myself to the fact I'm like th I'm 36, mm -hmm. so I'm just like maybe I'm just gonna be single forever. But all my friends, yeah. same thing, moved on in relationships, you know, whatever it is, and I'm yeah, I'm like still... you split any any time relationship, like you take a break, like oh. I think so many people watch that dumb friends episode where like, they were like, they're on a break. And then, mm -hmm. and it's like the whole thing is the Ross and Rachel, like, will you know, and then they yeah. end up together. And I think all these girls were like, Oh, that can work. That can, that can, people can get back together and people get, it's just the different timing and whatever. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't know anyone who's super happy after all this time that like took a break or like, yeah, I know. I completely agree. And I think, I think you're absolutely right about the sitcom thing. Cause I feel like a lot of people learned how to, or learned how to be in a relationship by watching that shit. Like I've been yeah. in relationships with people where I'm like, I think I've seen this episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, exactly. I, I don't know why this sounds familiar to me, but uh, exactly. 
didn't they do this in the 90s? Yeah. Um, round well, never try to fit a round peg in a square hole or whatever. It is. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Um well, dude, thank you so much for coming on and for talking to us. And I'll definitely it's my pleasure. the album. Thanks. Um it was it was a blast getting to meet you and talk to you virtually, man. I really appreciate you too. it. You too, buddy. Thanks, man. Take care. Take care.